The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Advice Intelligence is the market leader in goals-based advice technology. Offering clients an end-to-end financial planning software solution, AI unleashes the true power of advice by providing a new world of advice software to enable planners to work smarter, not harder. Delivering financial advice in a way that's inspiring, cost-effective and scalable. AI makes it easy for advisors to have enriched and engaged conversations with clients so they can solve their problems and explore future possibilities together. This week's conversation is with Paul Nickel. Paul is the managing partner and senior financial planner at GFM Wealth Advisory. And we talk a lot today about client experience. Now, that's a word that gets thrown around a lot. But we deep dive into exactly what they do as a business to reward their clients, to say thank you for being part of their business. And many of them have been clients for a decade or more. So I wanted to understand what's their secret sauce? What are they doing that keeps clients so happy for so long and telling so many of their friends and family to come and see them as well? Well, it's not hard to see why. We're going to talk community, events, client care, and the one percenters. Enjoy. Welcome, Paul. Hey, Jess. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on today. You were um, a very kind person in that I call, I kind of cold called you to see if you would be keen to do today's conversation. And bless you, you were intrigued and interested and then happy to participate. So I want to firstly call out and say thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for not thinking that I was trying to sell you steak knives. I very much appreciate that uh, because Paul, you run a really interesting business. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about the business itself. I want to spend more time talking through what are you doing on the client side? Because you're getting really great results, which we're going to spend some time unpacking. And I think for all of us, we're all trying to learn how can we make sure that we keep our clients happy. It's one thing to get a good client, but let's keep them happy. And of course, the knock-on effect of that is you have people running around saying amazing things about you, and then more people want to come and work with you, which I know that you do really well. Before we jump into that, though, I'd love for you to give us all a bit of background in terms of you and your business. Yeah, sure. So um, the business is GFM Wealth Advisory. Mm -hmm. Um, We're 49 years young. We're going to reach year 50 next year in um, 2023, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, I joined the business in 1999, fresh out of university, Um, I was particularly fortunate in those early years of the industry that the barriers to entry weren't particularly high. Mm. And I was lucky enough at a very young age, at 22, 23, to almost immediately be put on the tools and see clients. It was a steep learning curve. But um, over the journey since 99, I was fortunate enough to firstly become a junior partner in the business uh, and a senior partner, now the managing partner of the firm. And yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of where the business sits today. And tell me more about, I mean, this isn't, this is an old business, which is um, rare, I think. It, well, it is. Yeah. I think we're very lucky our business on two fronts. The founder of the business, Tony Gillum, in many ways was a very early adopter of recommending clients had superannuation. And I think his early foresight in being a real supporter of the Australian superannuation system held our business in very good stead. And then I think, um, you know, we've been incredibly fortunate to have such a long duration of high quality relationships 
early adopters of superannuation and then self-managed superannuation. Mm. And, um, and, you know, and it would be remiss of me not to suggest that we um, have a really wonderful team here at GFM, very loyal staffing base. You know, we've nearly got 20 staff that have been with us over 10 years. Um, we're fortunate enough not get many staff leaving and most who are heavily immersed in what we're trying to achieve. So, yeah, it's a good, it's a strong business. It's a stable business. It's a business of longevity, but we're also growing strongly. Hang on. We need to just take a step back there. How many have you got in your team? Um, nearly 30, Jess. Yeah, nearly 30. And um, almost 20 of them have been with us um, 10 years or greater. So we have both financial planning and accounting. And, you know, we it, it's amazing. Um, I think what we really want to invest in with our clients is is a relationship that is longstanding. Mm. And, and our strong philosophy within the firm is, is if that we want longstanding relationships with our clients, mm. in reverse, we want to make sure that they feel a real stability in the team that we have here. So um, I think one of the core pillars of the, pillars of the business is, is, is relationships that are longstanding. Mm. And um, we're very fortunate that not just applies to our clients, but our staff are heavily immersed in that culture. That is amazing. Obviously, we're going to spend most of the time, I hope, today talking about that longevity of relationship and what that looks like and and what you've tried and tested and what's worked and what hasn't. Mm. But let's just pause for a minute because I think the the number of staff that you have and the percentage of the staff that have worked for that amount of time in the business screams to me that this is very interesting and quite rare. I mean- Everyone likes to think that they've built a, a, a business that has a great culture. No one's touting themselves as having a terrible culture in a business, but the proof, I think, a lot of it at the time is in tenure. What do you think you're doing that's different, that's kept people for so long? Look, there's no secret recipe to this. I guess we have a very strong DNA of our core and senior staff that have been here for a long while. Yeah. And I think when we do renew, recruit new staff as we're growing, Um, during that recruitment process, we're very clear to them that we want to invest in them and invest in them being in our business long term. Mm. And um, and then I guess when those new staff commence with us and in their early years of employment, they can really feel that the senior staff are are heavily invested in the business and have bought into this concept of of it being a long term um, relationship that we're not just entering with our clients, but with our staff as well. So, look, there's no there's no secret formula, Jess. Um, I think, you know, we all like to think we're recruiting quality people, but I think the people that you put into the organisation, your new staff, I think they quickly inherit the traits of the existing staff. And we do have a very strong core of staff that have been with us for a long while um, that, um, you know, that we continue to make it clear that our objective is is for it to be a long-term relationship. And given, Paul, you still see clients, uh, have you employed someone that does, I mean, that's a lot of people to to manage. From a hierarchical perspective, do you have someone who's dedicated to that? Um, No. Look, I I certainly, I'm the senior partner in the firm and um, the other partner in the firm is Patrick Malcolm. And, Mm. um, you know, he he certainly assists me with the day-to-day running of the business. I have a great operations manager, Melanie McLennan, Mm. who also takes... um, you know, a high degree of that um, of that HR work off my hands. But look, I've got to say, Jess, um, I, I don't feel like our staff need a lot of managing. Um, um, maybe that's easy for me to say because Melanie and Patrick, you know, share the, <laughs> the load with me. But um, we're also very big on our staff having um, responsibilities and autonomy. Um, I, I'm very strong on um, our staff wanting um, to be thinking about the business and acting in a way like they owned the business so that they feel like they're important decision makers. Mm. So, you know, a lot of our staff have very key areas of responsibility for which they set themselves, um, you know, goals and objectives each year. And then we largely allow our staff to autonomously, um, you know, they'll always be reporting back. But we, I think it's important that staff also feel like that they can be decision makers and um, are heavily involved in the successes of the business through their exertion. Great. Let's talk client side. How many clients 
do you think the business has and what is your area of focus? And then, of course, we're going to talk client experience. Yeah. Well, I know how many clients we've got. On the financial planning side of the business, we have around 800 clients. Okay. So um, we have financial planning and accounting, but I think it would be fair to say that um, GFM Wealth, our niche client is the pre-retiree or retiree. Mm -hmm. And the very vast majority of our clients um, do have self-managed super funds. Now, um, you know, not one size fits all, fits all here at GFM. Um, we, you know, we're an off-platform business. We run individually managed accounts for all of our clients, but our service offering does suit the pre-retiree or retiree, and predominantly that pre-retiree or retiree is warehousing their wealth within a self-managed super fund, for which we're able to provide, um, you know, effectively a full end-to-end service within our firm, having financial planning and accounting. I'm interested in, in, I'm interested in lots, obviously, but I'm interested in understanding because you have a really strong client retention rate and you have a really strong client referral rate. So I want to, before we get stuck into that, I want to talk about the experience that you offer someone so we can learn more about what is it that they're getting. And then let's talk more about sort of what are the things that are on top of that that you've offered and and the successes and failures and learnings from that as well. Okay, there's a lot in that question. I know, Um, sorry. (laughs) Basically, (laughs) tell me everything, Paul. Yeah, okay. All right. So, look, um, perhaps I'll go back a step before we go forward a step. Yeah. Um, There are many fine financial advisors here in Melbourne. We're a Melbourne-based firm and there are many fine financial advisors throughout Australia. Mm. Now, I don't really feel like we compete against each other. But I think some of the work that we do is subjective and some of the work we do is objective. I think all the very, all the very good planners with the objective work they do around putting together a strategy are very good at what they, what, what they do. Then the subjective side of things is obviously the way we go about investing our clients' wealth. Now, if there was a golden formula for that, wouldn't that be easy? It's not. Mm -hmm. But, um, overarching that subjectivity and objectivity of what we do, it's our, firm belief that the client experience is where we can differentiate ourselves against our peers. Now, I stress again, I don't really feel like we're competing against anybody, Yeah. but there are a lot of firms doing some very good work. And whilst I don't feel like we're competing against them, I do consider them competition. So it keeps us on our toes. So I guess the GFM philosophy is that um, we want to offer an exceptional client experience. And if we offer an exceptional client experience, then there's a very strong probability that both our clients will refer Mm -hmm. and more importantly, that we will get that long-term relationship with our clients. So we're we're, we're really proud of the fact that in the near 50 years that that we've been going, we've got hundreds of clients that have been with us 20, 30 or 40 years. And I think that longevity is very much a a byproduct of our extensive focus on the client experience. What does that investment of time on the experience actually look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question, Jess. So um, firstly, um, as an accounting and financial planning firm, Mm. unlike a lot of financial planners out there that don't have an accounting firm, Um, you know, perhaps accountants are a good referral source for them. We don't really tend to get a high level of referrals from accountants by virtue of the fact that we have an accountancy firm, which I can understand, right? That that makes sense. Yeah. So we know that the best chance of our business growing is by our clients being walking mouthpieces, walking and talking advocates of our business, So as a firm, um, you know, our marketing um, team is led by May Davies, who's been with us well over 30 years. Firstly, May knows all the clients and May's ably supported by the head of our SMSF team, Witty Sumu, who's almost been with us 30 years. And likewise, she knows all the clients. So the first thing is none of our clients are a number. They're all people. They're real people that we have deep relationships with. And then I guess... Just maybe something we do a little bit different or think about a little bit different is a lot of firms at financial planning firms advertise um, or they market and they have budgets for that. Mm. We do too, but we don't have marketing budgets that are to attract external um, potential clients. 
our whole marketing budget is spent on our clients, okay? Um, so not only do we want to have the client experience to be the best possible experience, but in many ways, if somebody becomes a client of our firm, I kind of want it to be known to them that a reward of being invested with us and in us, our firm as a client, that our marketing is actually spent on them, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. What I am fascinated by, and I want to get stuck into more specifics about how you deploy those resources, yep. but I think it's, I've worked for the big end of town and the teeny tiny end of town. Yep. Marketing people, hello and welcome if you're listening, are often completely siloed and not at all slash ever given an opportunity to learn really at the coalface about the people that they end up marketing for mm. actually is, I think it's extremely unusual for your head of SMSF and your head of marketing to know the clients. Presumably that helps making sure that everything that you're putting out is targeted and appropriate. Was that a deliberate? Yeah. How did that come about? No, it, it's, it's, it's organically grown, but is also very deliberate. I guess the longevity of those two staff members, yeah. May and Witty, combined with the longevity of our advisors and all of our advisors, uh, well, the core of our advisors have been with us for a long while. Yeah. But uh, we're not an institution, okay? We're not, uh, our clients are not a number. I think the number one thing for us is the clients to understand their number one and they are known, they are real people. So whether we have implementation meetings, that's always conducted by a staff member in person, um, maybe called me a little bit old fashioned. Um, you know, in the industry, we're all looking for automation. And, you know, so when you make a client appointment, you, there's all automation tools, and then you can send texts and emails. We're, we're, look, I'm certainly not against that automation and that creates a scalability. But at the same time, um, I also love the old fashioned, we call our clients to make an appointment or we get on the phone to make sure that we're speaking to them. And I think one of the things that we probably did very well during the COVID lockdowns is, is, is you know, all of our staff made sure that we were touching base, particularly being a Melbourne based firm, the fact that we were locked down for such an extended period. We, we, we wanted to know, we wanted our clients to know, we, we you know, we care deeply about them. So we were regularly making contact with them one-on-one -on -one rather than through automated services. So I guess, you know, whether it's appointment generation, whether it's implementation, whether it's just touching base to say hi, we, we, we don't want a phone phobia in the office and, and automation can create that. In fact, we want the opposite. We want our clients to know that, you know, we can reach out and both we're happy to reach out via the a phone medium or catch up with them face to face. Phone phobia exists, I think, for anyone sub 30. Yes. I have found that there is like this weird generational thing now where people are like, ew, you're calling me. But yes. so valuable and so easy and underrated, I think, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. Again, I don't want to sound overly old fashioned, and maybe I do, but um, I think a, an exceptional client experience does involve a degree of um, of direct contact. Now, one could argue a phone call is indirect. Um, I think it's a better direct contact than an email or a text. Mm. Uh, but that face-to-face -face experience, particularly for our clients who are pre-retirees and retirees, they really, um, you know, in the surveys that we do with our clients, um, around our client experience, one of those things that rates very highly is the fact that we, you know, we do very much like catching up with our clients face to face and believe it or not, that we call them when something needs to get done. Isn't it amazing when you survey clients and you, you maybe have had the same thing, you know, sometimes you're racking your brain around, okay, what do people really get value from? And we deploy all this effort and energy in this particular thing. And we're confident that that's why they love us. And then you survey them and you're like, oh, Actually, what they really love is the phone calls that's really easy and really simple. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Jess. Now, it's not one size fits all. Of course, there are some busy professionals that we have that like the idea of getting the email on calendar and picking out a time and a date. And we certainly understand and respect that. But we certainly find for our longer standing clients or particularly the retired, client, the retired clients, that face-to-face that -face or those touch points via the phone, they very much appreciate those little extras. 
Sure. Uh, let's go back to the marketing piece. So I think it's really clever to deploy your marketing budget on existing clients because they become mm-hmm. the billboard for your your business. Yep. What does that look like for you? Yeah, yeah, great question. So we run a lot of client events, okay? And I think we could largely break down the events to either being purely social or being part social, part educational. So as a firm, for many, many years, we've run um, uh, events on behalf of clients, face-to-face events. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the key events that we run that um, I'll I'll bracket under the social um, um, umbrella is the fact that for many, many years, um, we've run um, movie nights for clients. So our movie night's actually so successful, we now have to run two. That, that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're very lucky. The clients love coming along to that, and they love bringing friends or, or guests as well. But um, you know, we managed to run two movie nights almost um, as our end of year event, late November, early December, um, where you know we'll both evenings we'll we'll fill the cinema with three hundred clients. You know, both evenings. So that's a great capture in that in a social environment, many of our clients are able to come along and attend. And it's almost sort of, they almost ask, you know, what's the date for next year? You know, I'll put it in the diary now because December's a busy busy month. So that's social. We run um, client dinners. Um, We love having um, client dinners, generally more large scale dinners where once again, we'll invite, you know, between 100 to 150 clients along to a dinner. Um, Often those clients um, are clients that have either been with us for a long period of time or have been kind enough to be referrers in the more recent period and we just want to thank them for their kind word of mouth and we'll get a guest um, speaker to come along and it doesn't necessarily need to be financially related, mm-hmm. just a, a person of interest. So our, our clients love um, that those um, dinners. We run a golf day, you know, our clients that like playing golf and golf's not for everybody. And we're conscious of the fact that not all of our clients play golf, but a lot of our retired clients love playing golf. Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they love attending our golf day. So we do that. Um, yeah. And and then, you know, I guess under the, the umbrella of part social, part educational, one of the things that we've always done for a number of years is we run, you know, four to six face-to-face educational seminars a year. So whether it's an economic outlook, whether it's a share market update, whether it's us bringing in a fund manager or or somebody of note that, that can explain to them what's going on in markets or in the economy um, or specific to, um, you know, an investment asset class. Uh, we do that four to six times a year. We often run lunch events. We do run some evening events for the working clients. But again, more often than not, that we, you know, we'll get 150 to 200 clients attend those events, you know, or we'll do it on estate planning and get an estate planning lawyer to come in. Or so again, remember we we look after pre-retirees and retirees. So the 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 topics of interest for our niche client, that's the area that we specialize in. Um, you know, will often differ from those who perhaps are younger and are looking at different topics of of interest, you know. So, um, so yeah, those educational events are a very big part of what we do as well. And it's amazing how many clients religiously attend and also bring guests as well. And that's, that's also another touch point for the client. You know, often we see our clients once, two or four times a year, depending on the need of the client. But if they're turning up to a client dinner or a client movie night or an educational seminar, then all of a sudden you're seeing that client three, four, five, six times a year, both in a social and formal setting, which is nice. And I would imagine that given that these people come A, regularly th- through the year, but also come year on year, actually what you're building is a community where people have seen that other person's face for a number of times and they end up saying hello. And do you find that people are actually socialising within those events as well and, and starting to learn more about who else you work with? hundred percent, Jess. Yeah, it is a community. I, 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 I'm our, our firm, our clients are a community. Mm. Um, our clients turn up to these events and they see the same staff because we've got a very loyal core of staff so there's a familiarity there, but there's also a familiarity with who they see when they come to the events. It never strikes or it never ceases to amaze me. We run our golf event 
the clients ring up and say, oh, yeah, 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 we're coming again this year and can we play with so-and-so, so-and-so, right? And we're like, wow. Okay, so they almost fulfill their own groups or they come to the events and they sit next to the same person or they get mm-hmm. to know. In fact, I've got to say, you know, um, running a client event, which May in our firm does exceptionally well, is not easy because you've got a whole lot of people that are coming and what you don't want are clients that feel isolated or sort of standing there by themselves or don't, you know, or perhaps, um, you know, don't find that environment a comfortable environment. I, I, I don't believe that happens in our business. I, I, I'm 100% sure that when our clients or our guests turn up to our events, the familiarity of knowing many of the other clients through attending these events and or knowing the staff well, it does become community-like. Yeah, no doubt, Jess. And I think in the world that we live in today where for many people, perhaps not in your age group, but for many people, religion used to be the community that everyone would rock up to and, and yeah. um, you know, we live in these fast-paced societies ironically with so much access to social media but we lack true connection and we lack true community i think this is a huge differentiator no doubt jess yeah really um you're 100 percent spot on i guess once again without you know um over reflecting on the covid environment jess and the lockdown environment here in melbourne but one thing that become very apparent to us was how many of our our retired clients actually viewed um, a large part of their social being in retirement being what we offered them, if that makes sense. Totally um, does. I really missed that. And since we've returned to running these events, you know, overwhelmingly the feedback that we're getting from these clients is how much they missed the, the community of our clients and attending these events during that period. I think this is so interesting. You obviously invest quite a bit of m- money in this, I can imagine, because these are these are a big event per per mm. quarter or whatever it is. You know, if you've got 150 or 200 people plus, you've got additional social events going on. So presumably, you've got the the resources that are dedicated. So so it sounds like May, who does the marketing, also That's does right. the events. Would it be fair to say that May is constantly throughout the year working on the next event? Uh, she's not just working on the next event, she's working on the next 12 months. As I said, Jess, we um, enter our 50th year next year at GFM and and, and we think that's worth celebrating. Totally. Um, May's already got the schedule all sorted out for next year. In fact, May already, you know, she's asking me, well, September next year when we're running the client dinner, now don't quote me on that, I think it's September, I don't have the calendar in front of me, but it's around that time. She's saying, who's going to come and talk at this seminar and which clients are we going to invite? So, yeah, we don't. We're not event to event. We, in fact, May puts together an events calendar, sort of three quarters of the way through the year, so that we've got the next calendar year fully organised. In fact, we need to do that because we want our staff attending the events. We want to make sure our staff are available. We want to make sure we give our clients good notice of when the events are on. They mark it in their diary. Um, so yeah, this is not an ad hoc approach. Um, this is a very carefully thought out approach to the activities that we want to conduct on a year by year basis. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, we, we are very lucky that May is, um, you know, completely dedicated to that and to the client piece where she's calling clients and touching base with them and or making appointments if that's necessary because um, she wants to still keep that touch with the clients, but at the same time be running the events. Um, Jess, one thing that you said that I think was interesting is this is not, yeah, there are some activities that are expensive. You run a client dinner, it's a decent client dinner, and you have 150 people come along. Um, you know, that that clearly costs money. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a decent investment. But in fact, if if we actually think about what our total marketing budget is, and we express that, which I won't hear, but if we express that per client in a dollar term, to spend that small amount for a client that's been with us 10, 20 or 30 years as a thank you, it, it, it's it's not a lot. And in fact, not all marketing activities are um, expensive, um, Jess. One thing that I was really proud of what we did during the COVID lockdowns is pretty much when we got locked down from March of 2020, one of the things that I was really concerned about is the loss of touch of clients and the fact that we ran so many face-to-face events, clients would miss that. So we got on the front foot. I'm sure we were one of the first firms that started doing, um, you know, Zoom events where we were ask where we were, you know, where we were running um, 
an educational event that went for an hour, which clients could dial into. Mm. We'd have a fund manager or somebody that we would ask questions of. We were getting hundreds of people that were dialing in live, um, hundreds of people that were watching the recordings, and it didn't cost a thing. Um, so, you know, we found that as a pretty good point. And there are other, lots of little smart things here. Phone calls, that doesn't cost a lot of money, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, there are other activities like golf days, dinners, movie nights. They're an investment, but, I, I, I you know, I think they're a reward. And what I love about what you do is it's very targeted. It's very specific. It's very strategic and tactical because I often have found that some people think that marketing and events are cute and that they're um, a nice to have and they're, not as well thought out or given as much attention as they could be given. And I think Mm. what you've proven is we all need a May, uh, but if you are clever and considered and organized, you can build something that is very special and very rare and basically have people knocking down your door to figure out when the movie night is for the next year. I mean, that is something to be hugely proud of. Massive congrats to you and the team. That is Obviously, a lot of hard work and years of effort, um, and I think very rare. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, can I just I, I just want to stress, um, we love seeing our clients. We love catching up with our clients. I've got to tell you, I genuinely enjoy mm. being at these events. Yeah, you get a little bit nervous beforehand. Is it going to go well? Is this going to work? Is it not going to work? We're trying this. We, we haven't done this before. What about that? Now, firstly, you know, again, um, it's a team effort here, but, you know, May having done this for a number of years instills a high degree of confidence that if we're going to try something more more often than not, it's going to work. But we actually want to do it. We, we, we want to do it. So, yeah, we are highly organised. We are very strategic about the way we go about it. But at the core of this is it, it is a thank you to our client. It is a community. Um, we, do, we do want to do it and we love catching up with our clients. So, it's easier to do it if you actually enjoy doing it too, if that makes sense. Totally. And what I yeah. think is quite clever about a movie night, if I can just say it as a secret introvert, the yeah. best social event ever because you get to spend a whole night with someone, but actually yep. for about two hours of that, you don't have to talk to people. That's clever. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, you're right. You know, we pack out the movie night. I, you know, I am all of us trying to get around all the clients and say a quick hello. They know it's a busy evening, so they don't, you know, they don't really ask for much of your time. And we get up at the start of the movie and say thank you. We just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all your support. And they leave contented. You know, they get they they you know they they get fed and uh, they you know get a, some popcorn and some ice cream on the way in. They get to watch a good movie. Who doesn't like that? No, you know what I, mean? I completely agree. This is very yeah. clever. And also what you've created is a very clear sense of who you work with because if people are able to see over and over again regularly, you've really reminded them these are the types of people that we work with, these are the types of people we love helping. And so yeah. I'm keen to get more into the referral sort of side of things, but I would imagine it's quite easy for a, for a client who's been with you for a long time who loves what you do and who's seen not only the work that you've done for them, but also the work that you've done for people that look similar or different, I'm not sure, but it surely makes it easier for when they see someone who is a good fit to refer to you. A hundred percent. Jess, very good again. Yeah, we can shift the conversation to referrals, but the common um, feedback that we get from a prospective client that attends our educational events. A prospective client doesn't get to come to the dinner or the movie night. That's a reward to client. That's social. Yeah. But these seminars, these webinars, um, these educational events, they are free for anybody to attend. Our clients bring guests. Yeah. There's no – this is all informational. It's a very, it's, it, it's a very relaxed environment, but the overwhelming feedback we get is – oh, wow, we can't believe how many of your clients come along and we can't believe how many nice things they have to say about you, you know, so whether they're dealing with our advisors, Patrick or Sam or James or Amelia or myself mm. or our associates, Karen and Nook and the, and, and, and the like, um, the, the first bit of feedback we get is, is, is the clients that attend and always attend, once they know it's a guest that they're speaking to, we don't ask them to do it, but they just say, oh, you know, they're wonderful and I've been a client for X amount of years and we're so happy. And 
you know, I think um, that can only assist in the process of potentially it, um, having a client who maybe was thinking about becoming a client, being more confident in their decision to become a client. I think in our world, trust is so exceptionally important. And mm. we know that there often is fear and hesitation around, is this person mm. trustworthy enough for me to deploy my life savings to them? And so having people who are not paid by you, who are complete advocates, create so much immediate trust, oh, I would imagine. Geez. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I went and got my hair cut last week, as you do, um, and um, um, I go see the usual hairdresser, and um, and he was unavailable. I didn't know. I turned up and he was unavailable, and I had a a, 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 a different gent that was doing my hair. Mm. And straight away, I was a bit anxious. I was a bit like, oh, oh, geez, uh, I don't, I don't know. I hope he does a good job. And mm. and there was this inbuilt anxiety because I hadn't built a rapport with him. I built a rapport with my hairdresser. Now we're talking about a haircut, Jess. Yeah. What's it like for a client? that's got their life savings that they've got to make a decision on. Trust isn't one immediately. Mm -hmm. Trust is earned. And if there are different touch points in the decision-making process of a prospective client that solidifies that they feel like we're the right type of people to work with, that's got to be advantageous. So prospective clients coming to our seminars, I know they're impressed. They get to see what we stand for. They can see what we are as a business. They can see the people. They know our DNA. Mm. That's got to help, Jess, I think. Totally. And do you do any tracking of whether it's likely that someone will come to a number of events before they come on as a, as a client? Like, do you do any tracking of, of the um, success of non-clients coming to those events? We. Um, the answer is yes and no. Okay. So partly yes, because we ask all of our clients, it's mandatory um, when we have a client event that we ask for our clients' feedback. Mm -hmm. Now, for the clients who've been coming years and years and years, they tick excellent, 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 thank you, loved it, rah, rah, rah. But we actually want them to give us feedback that we can use to improve. Now, yeah. the beauty of the client um, providing an evaluation is we also are asking the prospective client um, for an evaluation. And we're also asking them if they haven't had a meeting before with one of our advisors, they've been brought along as a guest, would they like to have a meeting? Mm -hmm. So we do find that a high number of our guests that attend, in the back of their mind is that, that they want to deal with a financial advisor. They're perhaps not ready yet to make an appointment or feeling courageous enough yet to make an appointment because they don't really know who we are. Then they attend the event. We ask them to fill in the evaluation form. Would you like a meeting? The very vast majority then say yes. They say yes, we'd love to have a prospective client meeting. Um, so we absolutely ask um, the prospective client if they would like an appointment via the evaluation after the events. Is that a physical form or is that a form that, that you email out? Um, yeah, both. Um, we, so we do have a physical form for some events and then some events we have an electronic form, okay? Generally, the, the events where... Um, we um, are more likely the, the very the, the events that are educational that we're more likely to have the prospective guests come along. We actually ask we do a paper evaluation form that they literally hand in on the way out. Now again, a little bit old school, but one of the things is if you do an electronic one where you've got lots of guests, then you know it sits in their emails. Do they address it? They leave it alone. They don't really feel the need to do it. But if they turn up to our event as they're leaving, we're like, got your form. Exactly. I've had exactly the same. I mean, I, I am younger, but I think, yeah. so that's why I was interested because I think the, the, the hardest part, if you're going to do an e post event survey or wrap up, getting the feedback from any, you know, people are well intentioned, but people are also busy. So no, I'm, I'm going old school with you here as well. I actually think paper is the way to go here because you do get yeah, that type of feedback. Yeah, I think for those events, yeah. But then there's some events where the electronic evaluation form makes a lot of sense because it's easier to collate the response and to know what to do with the response and view it in all one spot. So um, we'll do both is okay. the answer, Jeff, depending on what we're looking to achieve out of the evaluation. And so presumably the growth year on year of your business through client acquisitions is predominantly referrals from existing clients and or people who have attended the event? Yeah, quite right. Yeah, no, no, no. I'd suggest um, 80% of our referrals are from existing clients. Um, you know, we have got a growing level of inquiries where I guess people have looked at us from our website 
and that, you know that's steadily growing. We, we you know we prefer the client referral because we we find it's a far more warm referral and more more likely than not yeah. um, that prospective client knows the type of client that we look after. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we as I said, we don't really get many referrals from accountants um, or other professionals. Um, we do very much. Um, it's it's all you know. The large vast majority is generated via our clients. What do you do when you've got a client who sings your praises, loves you, refers lots and lots of people, but the advisor that they work with either isn't the right advisor for the client that they've referred, or that advisor doesn't have capacity to take them on? Does that happen? And how do you manage yeah. that? I just got to get on the front foot straight away. Um, you you know, um, I think you got to talk to the um, ref, the referrer, and which we do. I, look, I'm, you know, I'm an advisor. I'm still on the tools here. Mm. Um, I deal with a handful of clients. Yep. Um, and um, you know, and those clients are kind enough to refer on occasion where it's not possible for me to see the cl- the person that they've referred. Mm. Um, um, or if I'm not sure that I'm suited to them, the mm. first thing I do is get on the phone and speak to the referrer. I, you know, so if you refer Jess, I say, hey, Jess, just want to let you know so-and-so contacted me. I'm getting a little bit of a feeling about this. What do you think? I'm thinking this might be. And they actually really enjoy it. Firstly, they're thrilled that the prospective client has contacted us and that they've listened to them. Uh, they're thrilled that we've called them and spoken to them about it and said thank you. Um, and then... Um, yeah, and then from there, um, we, you know, I think it's just about the upfront communication. And I, I you know, the, the our clients know that whether I'm the advisor or somebody else is the advisor here in the firm, we all think alike, and we're all doing exactly the same work. I have a strange question. Mm-hmm. Given a lot of the sort of one percent things that you do that really differentiate you, actually require you to be time critical and and proactive, particularly mm. with phone calls. How do you manage that from a diary perspective? Yeah, it's not easy. Mm. Uh, not easy. Um, we have busy diaries, and if you do call a client um, for whatever purpose it is, hi, how are you going? Hey, I need to talk to you about this. Hey, you've referred this person. I want you to. Um, they're never two minute conversations. Mm. Um, those conversations can actually take quite a while because inevitably then you talk to them about other stuff. Oh, how are you going? What's your footy team doing? Rah, 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 rah. Stuff that you talk to them about all the time, right? Mm. Um, um, yeah, look, so, um, you know, each of our advisors have different workflows during the day. Um, Jess, I, I, I'm a little bit strategic about the way I handle my work day. I like to get into the office very early. How early? And I like, how early? Tell me. Uh, Share your secrets. 7 a.m.? Oh, yeah, that's early. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I like to spend the first hour or hour and a half doing work where I know I largely won't be uh, interrupted and where I know that it needs my strongest focus, okay? Mm. As the day progresses and I've had a client meeting or a staff meeting, I probably know that my level of sharpness is slightly declining. I'm more a morning person than an afternoon or evening person. So I actually like to do a lot of my phone calls in the afternoon. And, you know, I've got to also say I do call a lot of my clients from the car on the way home. Um, I'll I'll take a list of two or three clients that I just want to say hi to or ring them for a purpose. I'm on my way home. You know, I say, look, I'm in the car. I hope you don't mind, but I just wanted to touch base, rah, 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 rah. Um, Or I call them late in the day because I know that – that's the time of the day where I'm A, most likely to get a hold of them, but B, um, it's better for me to be having those more social or easier conversations. I find phone calls very easy, right? So I yeah. love that you call from the car. Can we just stop? And I just need to, we just need to stop this for a second. Calling from the car. So let's just think about this. Yeah. Many people listening to this would be like, oh, you can't call a client from the car. That sounds unprofessional. Actually, Presumably, you've got a good relationship with them, but we've already covered that. I think that is so clever because it says to me, A, there's a huge authenticity piece that you're a human and doing human things. But B, it's like, you are so important that I didn't want to miss talking to you today. And this was the only opportunity to, but I had to because you are so important. I hope you don't mind. And that, that's a that's a hundred percent. Um, in fact, when I ring and I and the first thing I say is say, look, I'm in the car. Rah, 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 I just wanted to ring you on the way home. I wanted to make sure I got a hold of you today. First thing is they say is say, Paul, you don't need to call me now. I say, but I want to. I, I want to call you now. Look, 
part of it is clearly wanting to clear the decks by the end of the day. So I feel like I can come in the next day and start a fresh day without perhaps the overhang of some things I wanted to achieve the day before. And you've always got an overhang, haven't you, Jess, you know? But hmm. um, in fact, the clients quite like it. I think it's um, great. I think that's yeah. very clever. And also, yeah. like, being stuck in traffic is terrible. And if you can use it as part of your work day and be more efficient, that is smart. 100%. Yeah, it takes me, you know, with peak hour traffic, um, I leave early so I get to work in a reasonable time. But on the way home, it could take me up to 45 minutes to get home. Um, so if I can make two or three calls um, and before I sort of know it, I'm three quarters of the way home. And actually then I've got to say that's a very good mechanism for me to turn off because mm. once I've made those calls and I get home, I think to myself, beauty, you've done what you wanted to achieve today. Yep. Focus on the family now, right? So um, it's part selfish, that I can do it in um, a time that isn't that productive when you're driving. Um, but the clients actually, I, uh, the number of them say, oh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for calling now, Rara. I really appreciate it. You're kind of catching them at a good time too, I feel. So, yeah. I could ask you many questions all day long, but we can't, alas, because you have work to do, um, as we've just discussed. I think it's extremely obvious why people want to stay with you for a long time and people want to refer people that they know and tr- trust and need help to Mm. you. You're doing some big stuff really well, but you're also doing some small stuff really well. The stuff Mm. that's hygiene that often gets missed or slipped, um, it sounds to me like you've built a culture where those one percenters are not taken for granted and they become everyday things that are must-dos that I think it's a good reminder. Yeah, 100%, Jess. Um, People notice attention to detail, Mm. right? You know, the number of times somebody will do something for you, but you knew that the attention for detail wasn't there. So whilst you're grateful they've done something for you, but you know that they weren't fully focused on it, um, can let that piece down. I think the attention to detail is the most important part. If you're going to, if you, if you really feel like you've got an exceptional offering, which I think we do, Mm. um, our, I think our client offering is exceptional. The attention to detail has to be there or it's not exceptional. Thank you so much. Um, Before we wrap up today's conversation, can I ask you some bigger, more random, less business questions? Oh, God, God, Jess. I I, I promise I've got a life, so I will be able to answer some of these, okay? (laughs) Of course you've got a life. You get home, put the car in the garage, no doubt, and then you have a real life, which is exciting. Yes. Um, I want to finish with some rapid-fire questions. Before I do, though, um, a huge thank you so much. As I said, (laughs) Cold calling is not dead, dead people. Thank you very much, Paul, for um, being part of today's XY podcast. If people want to learn more about you, how can they? Um, about our business, they can just hop on our website. I think our website's full of information. Um, so it's, our business is GFM Wealth. So yep. if you look it up, yep. lots of information and there's bios on all of our staff and everything. Like that. I particularly like that you also put which football club people go for. So then I can laugh whether they've done well or not so well. I felt sorry for you about the uh, the recent Swan. ones. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, AFL is almost like a religion in Melbourne, right? Mm. So um, if, if you're ever struggling to break the ice here in Melbourne, you just ask them who they barrack for, right? And most of the time that does the job. I'd imagine that creates some interesting conversations for you. Okay, so <laughs> rapid fire questions for you. I'd love to know what's one thing that you do to look after your mental health, Paul? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm quite conscious of this. Um, there's two things I do. Yeah. So firstly, um, when I switch off from work, I either like to be surrounded by family and friends that help me switch off. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I just find their company engaging and easy to to just enjoy. Yeah. Um, um, But I, 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 um, I do make a little bit of an effort to just spend some quiet time with myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I think you know a large part of what we do in the business here is 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 that we're constantly engaged with our clients all the time, and then you're very you know if you're social in your social life. Um, So I, I do try to spend some time to myself, if that makes sense. So whether that's going for a quiet walk, whether it's just sitting there and watching the TV without really watching it, whether it's exercising, I think that time to yourself matters. I agree. Do you have a piece of advice that you would give to young Paul? Oh, wow. There'd be lots of advice. Um, I think probably um, listen. Um, Listen. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I think you learn so much when you're younger, but how much of it you absorb because you're probably not really listening. Hmm. I I think I could have been a better listener when I was younger. Okay. 
What is something that's on your bucket list that you haven't ticked oh, off yet? I've got lots of stuff on the bucket Do list. You? Um, yes. I've, I've kind of I've got this itch I want to scratch. I want to I want to go to Mount Kilimanjaro and walk to the top. Um, Jess, don't ask me why. I have no idea. Who cares why? That's exciting. Yep. And I want to do it before I'm 50, so I've got a few years to go yet. Good. Um, and I want to do it with people that I kind of, I, I almost kind of want it to be like my 50th thing. So I've, I've got to find the right people who are prepared to take up the challenge with me. But, um, yeah, I want to do that. Awesome. Uh, last question. I have a fake book club. Do you have a book yeah. that uh, you could recommend to me as part of my fake book club? Uh uh, no, uh, yes and no. I'm, I've, funnily enough, just this weekend, just this weekend gone, yeah. a good mate of mine um, gave me Dave Grohl's book. So Dave Grohl oh, from, from the, the Red Hot Foo Fighters Chili Peppers. called The Storyteller. Now, I am not into The Foo Fighters. I just said and The Red fact, Hot Chili Peppers from The Foo Fighters, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not a massive um, music person, but a mate of mine said to me over the weekend, he said, you've got to read this. It's damn good. So it's sitting on the bedside mantle, and I'm going to be getting stuck into that over the next couple of weeks. What's it called? Um, it's Dave Grohl. I think it's called The Storyteller. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Interesting. Now, I've got to be honest with you, it's not the type of book I would normally read, but he was very insistent I read it, so I, I will. I think we all need diversity in what we read. Yeah. I think that's probably what he was saying. Uh, I have learned so much from you about your business, about how – connectivity and community can be brought into financial planning businesses with care um, and consideration. And it's amazing to see what you've done is generating growth within the business year on year as well. So a huge congratulations to you and your team. And thank you again for being part of today's podcast. Oh, thank you, Jess. I appreciate your interest in our business and in me. And um, I've really enjoyed the chat. So thank you. Thank you.